Thank you. Next is uh, Marcel Vanden Linden, who comes to us from the International Institute for the Study of Social History in Amsterdam, of which he was the director for many years. He has a particular interest in transnational labor history, as can be seen in his latest book, which is Workers of the World. Thank you. Brian, as we know, is an internationalist, and uh, rightly so, and that's also why on the program we have this slogan of the Socialist Party, Workers of the World Unite, and I would like to talk about this, the difficulties of realizing this slogan. Uh, internationalism, as you of course know, is extremely difficult. It's a beautiful ideal, but it's rarely, uh, rarely becomes a reality. Uh, the world uh, labor movement, let me start at looking at the present day, the world labor movement is in deep trouble. Um, we have a, a first problem is the uh, world global union, the global union density. Uh, the largest union in the world now is the ITUC, the International Trade Union Confederation, which was founded in 2006 as a merger of the the National Confederation of Free Trade Unions and the, so let's say, more secular organization and the World Confederation of Labor, the Christian organization. And it now has about 170 million uh, members. It sounds like a lot. Uh, and then uh, there's 30 million people are in unions that are not in the ITUC. So a total uh, group of organized workers in, on the, in the world of 200 million. Uh, I do not count the All China Trade Union Confederation as a union. Uh, it is larger than the whole ITUC, uh, 235 million members, but it's not a union in the sense that it has its own independent policies. Um, so we have 200 million uh, people in the unions, and uh, the world's so called active population at this moment counts 2.9 billion people. So according to the ITUC itself, uh, local, the global union density is 7%. 7%. Uh, and it is declining because the union movements across the globe are not in good shape. We just heard about Canada, problems in Canada, but it's a more general thing. I've heard uh, some figures of trade union densities in a number of countries. And you see, well, Canada's doing relatively well, uh, just like uh, Norway. But uh, in most countries, it's much worse. And then you think, ah, India, great case. 41% of the workers are in unions. But uh, the union membership is counted for the formal sector, so the sector where workers have a kind of contract. And that is 8% of the labor force in India. So, in fact, 41% of 8% is organized, which comes down to 3.2%. So, situation is not uh, very, make, doesn't make us very optimistic, I think. And that's, so, that's the first problem. The, we, the global labor movement is extremely weak. Of course, there are local differences, and especially in, in, in Europe uh, and in Australia, and so there is. Uh, there's still a lot going on, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not, uh, in Canada, of course, it's, it's not something to be uh, happy with. The second problem is that within this world working class, we have all kinds of serious contradictions, inequalities. Uh, a persistent and universal, almost universal uh, contradiction is, of course, the gender contradiction. Uh, which I do not have to explain, I think. Uh, but we also have gigantic income differences within the world working class. If you think of the fact that in 2014, GDP per capita in Canada was 38,000 American dollar, US dollars, and in Vietnam it was 1,000 US dollars. So GDP per capita here is 38 times higher than it is in Vietnam. Then you can imagine that there's a world separating uh, workers in these two uh, different uh, locations. Now I want to focus a little bit on these uh, huge uh, differences. 
because they of course have massive implications for the possibilities of worldwide solidarity. And we can distinguish several types of inequalities apart from the gender inequality. I want to illustrate this with uh, one, ex one case with my genes. Um, these genes have been thoroughly studied and um, so I can tell you that there are two kinds of cotton involved in my genes. Cotton for the pockets, which is the soft cotton, which comes from Benin in Africa, and the tough uh, uh, cotton which comes from Pakistan. Then you have the zipper, and the zipper is made of zinc, which comes from a mine in Australia. Then you have the thread, which weaves everything together, that is uh, produced in a chemical factory in Frankfurt in Germany. And you have the indigo, which comes from a Japanese chemical factory. And this whole genes was assembled in Tunisia in a factory where 500 women are working to do this all day. And then it's sold in Amsterdam and there I bought it. Now, if you look at this kind of commodity chain, then it immediately becomes clear that there are uh, differences of interest between the different groups of workers in the chain. The workers in Tunisia, uh, it's in their short-term material interest that the workers down the line, so the, the, the peasants and the, the, the uh, agricultural workers producing cotton, for instance, or the miners in uh, Australia producing zinc, that they are paid not very well. Because the lower the cost for the wages is at the beginning of the, uh, of the chain, the higher the profits are at the end, so it means that the uh, job security for the workers in Tunisia is better if the, the, the profit margin is larger, uh, the chances of wage increases are better, and so on. And then finally, the consumers, who to a large extent are, of course, wage earners and uh, workers in Amsterdam, they also profit from the exploitation down the line. So here we have a case of what I would call relational inequality. So some parts of the working class profit from the bad treatment of other parts of the working class. So this is a real conflict of interests. Apart from that, of course, you also have non-relational inequalities where there's very indirect connections between uh, the, the, uh, that explain why different groups have different treatment, different payment. I have written a paper for this session, but could for technical reasons not be distributed. Uh, in which I go deeper into this, and in the paper I uh, focus especially on one very old-fashioned concept, that of the labor aristocracy. Um, a concept dating from the first decades of the 19th century, and the idea behind this uh, notion of the labor aristocracy was that some parts of the working class have such a high living standard that uh, they no longer identify with the uh, problems of the world working class as such. So, um, and we have two kinds of theories of labor aristocracies. One is the narrow and the other is the broad one. The narrow one uh, says that national classes, workers, have within themselves a section which is the aristocratic uh, section. Uh, this is a theory that was first articulated by Friedrich Engels and then by Lenin, Zinoviev, Fugarasi, Hobsbawm and many others. And it has also in the 1970s, in the 1970s be applied to Africa, where you had a whole debate on the question whether there were, were labor aristocracies in Africa. There's a number of weaknesses of this narrow interpretation. You have the economism, which is implicit in it, so that uh, because it's not proven that workers that are better paid are more reactionary than workers who are <coughs> paid worse. On the contrary, it's uh, often the case that the better paid sections of the working class are the most militant. Uh, it does not explain, as Lukács already emphasized, uh, why the non-aristocratic sections of the working class are also reformist. Uh, and empirical tests like that of Al Szymanski or uh, recently uh, Charlie Post have also refuted uh, this hypothesis, so if we can forget about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but, talking about the, the broad conception, 
The broad conception I was introduced, I think, or oh, this is something in between. It's an, ex an attempt to explain why unions in the third in, in the in the global south are so weak by Otto Sturmthal, Austrian American guy who says it's because collective bargaining is not possible in uh, m many situations in the global south and um, therefore the traditional union tactics focusing on collective bargaining do not work. But now here, Lenin, 1907, long quote, but the important thing here is that he says that uh, as a result of the extensive colonial policy, the European proletariat party finds himself in a position where it is not his labor, but the labor of the practically enslaved natives uh, in the colonies that maintains the whole of society. So here, Lenin says that the whole British working class is a labor aristocracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, uh, so that in the course, of the course of the 19th century or so, you would have had a differentiation in the world working class where you have some national working classes that are much better situated than other uh, working, national working classes. Now, I think given the fact, the, the, the figures that I just gave you about uh, Canadian and Vietnamese uh, GDP per capita, this is true. There is, a, in the sense, not that it's necessarily a product of colonial uh, exploitation, but it is true that there are major differences and that some parts of some national working classes are much better off than other national uh, working classes. Now, there have been several uh, explanations uh, have been advanced to, to, uh, to see a look at this. Uh, one very important influential thing is unequal exchange as a theory, uh, first uh, developed, fully developed by uh, Fritz Sternberg, a German economist, uh, in his book The Imperialismus of uh, 1926, with a huge debate around that until the 1930s. And then in 1969, Argiri Emanuel, a Greek economist who had long worked in Africa, uh, he published the book L'Echange et Anigal, uh, which also created an enormous uh, discussion. And Sternberg's book has never been translated into English, to my knowledge, but uh, Emanuel's book has, and has also created debate in the English-speaking world. Um, and this is a very contested uh, theory for technical reasons, um, and I do not in, I go say a few things about this in the paper, but not I will not do that now, given time, time constraints. But there's another way of looking at this also possible, where you do not say that this is unequal exchange, but there are, that endogenous factors within the north have uh, created these differences between the north and the south, because we can agree on the fact. Economic historians show this, I think. Uh, quite well that until the late 18th century wage differentials globally were not very big. Most wages, except for some very, very skilled workers, were up at the subsistence level more or less. Although we already have some signs of changes uh, that in parts of Europe, especially also the Netherlands and, and uh, England, uh, wages are already going a bit up in the 18th century in comparison with other uh, places in the world. Now, another endogenous explanation would, be, for instance, be something like that developed by Paul Barock, who says that uh, uh, the introduction of new production methods in the, through the Industrial Revolution uh, initiated economic growth, and that had major implications. So it made, for instance, possible in the longer run <laughs> an improvement of standards of living, living uh, allowing a higher level of consumption of tropical products and therefore making a large colonial pro uh, empire uh, profitable. Uh, it also led to uh, this, this economic changes to a very significant population growth in the developed countries, tripling between 1780 and 1913, and again greatly increasing effective demand. It created technological innovations which gave Europeans the military, military capability to conquer and control large uh, and remote territories through better armament and so, and, and faster and larger ships. And fourthly, a higher level of development also meant the possibility of diverting more resources to colonial uh, ventures. So that is a kind of approach 
a different kind of uh, trying to explain uh, this, and you can develop this further. Well, Frank Scheller, a German Marxist, has uh, tried to do this. Um, anyway, so we have two possible, maybe more, but I know only two ways of looking at the causes behind these huge uh, differences. But differences, major differences, there are. Now, the provisional conclusion would be, I think, that um, in the 21st century, global working class solidarity is only conceivable as a political project uh, founded on long-term interests. If we take the short-term interests, then it, international solidarity is not possible. You need long-term interests, and people have to be conscious of these long-term common interests that they have. So, we need political, uh, it's to define this as a real political project, but if we do this, then we have another major problem, and that is that the political forces that traditionally we were with the unions and with the workers are weakening, and of course also <coughs> getting out of touch with the uh, workers. Let me give you an example here. Uh, so this is, I did not include the New Democratic Party here, sorry. Uh, you see, uh, I, I calculated 12 European countries and the Australian Labour Party, average election results. It's, I'm cheating here because the low 25% are not on the, uh, in the graph. But still you see that the high point was in the 1950s and 60s, or 40s even, and that it went down. And I think that many recent elections seem to confirm this uh, trend. Uh, social democracy is weakening. At the same time, it's uh, losing its uh, identity. It has lost its identity, one can say. Uh, a clear example of this is the tremendous growth of the Socialist International, that is the international organization of social democratic parties, uh, which uh, has... Uh, I think tripled its membership since the 1970s. So you think that's social democracy is doing well, but um, that's not the case because, uh, well, from the 46 <coughs> until the mid 70s, the figure was always constant around 36 member parties, and then it started to grow. But if you look at the parties that have joined, these are all not classical social democratic parties, but it's, for instance, the MPLA from Angola, or the Sandinistas from uh, Nicaragua, or the Acción Democrática, a very authoritarian party from uh, Venezuela. Uh, and so it means that nobody knows anymore what social democracy is. And that's also why in 1989, at the Conference of the Socialist International, they defined a new, uh, new statute, in so which they say that the Socialist International is for justice, equality, peace, and something else. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, if you are that, then you are a social democrat uh, nowadays. So, uh, social democracy is in deep crisis. But also, the communists are in deep crisis. Here I give you the example of the strongest communist party in Europe from after the war. Before the war, was the Germans, of course. Uh, you see that the decline already set in in the 1950s. So it has nothing to do with the collapse of the Soviet Union or so. There's a, a long-term decline of the French Communist Party. You see the same pattern in many other uh, communist parties, but it was too lazy to make many more graphs for you. Um, and so many communist parties have disappeared, dissolved, went bankrupt, uh, as in Finland, uh, merged with other groups. Um, in Bengal, for instance, in India also, where they were for a long time, they were the, the majority party, they now have reduced to two seats in parliament because of their neoliberal policies. So, the classical working class parties are fading away. And this uh, creates uh, uh, the, the main challenge for us, considering the difficulty of uh, developing uh, uh, solidarity across uh, the, the globe. So we have changes that we need changes in the union movements, which adapt themselves to uh, become unions for people of color, women, uh, in the global south, and so on. Uh, also organizing the informal sector. And at the same time, we need a drastic renewal of uh, working class political organizations. Thank you.